Good afternoon, everybody. It's Lumi and Finisher, and today I wanted to do a video with Michelle, but I'm going to lead this into the video, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, today's video, we're going to be talking about climate change. Um, Michelle did a video on this last time, and I wanted to give you my perspective. The International Center, International Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC, has been saying a lot of things lately, and they had been saying for a long time uh, that global warming was going to destroy the world. And it turns out that, first of all, there is no global warming. It's all global baloney. In fact, if anything, we have a climate that is clearly, as Michelle mentioned in her own video, heading towards a uh, cooling trend. This trend that we're talking about has probably resulted in a lot of trouble here for the United States, especially the Midwest and the East Coast. In fact, many municipalities in the East Coast have pointed out that they're running out of salt reserves. And while they're not exactly short on sand yet, um, they do see that their snow removal supplies are rapidly dwindling. Now, that worries me because we keep hearing them over the years, for many years, they had got to the point where they started reducing their snow removal budget because they figured that they didn't need to use it. Well, guess what? Baloney. It's actually getting worse. The snow is increasing. The temperatures are dropping. And Al Gore can basically go suck eggs because it's not what he expected. And if anybody knows about snowstorms, cold behavior, and weather trends, it would be Michelle. Michelle, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. Um, okay, i got a couple of questions. I'm asking these questions um, because me and Michelle did discuss this off camera, but we're going to finally address some of these questions on camera. Um, what do you think about what the IPCC has been saying, and do you think that they're starting to change their tune a little bit? Well, you know, the International Panel for Climate Change is um, is a group of scientists that want to push a globalist agenda. And the problem with them was, for a long time, because it was this trend that ended around 2007, that the Earth was going to get warmer, progressively warmer, so that by the time 2014 came, that the ice caps would be pretty much uh, a thing of the past in the winter time, um, and even in the summer in Antarctica, and and with the ice would be shrinking. <sighs> Trends show that in the summer, that's neither is the case in either one of those two areas. Well, it was true for a while. Two thousand seven, it was the last really hot summer um, overall. So, since that time, our temperatures have began a downward. Uh, decline not 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 rapid like instantly like one summer you got you know it's like 95 degrees in the shade and with a relative humidity of 100 percent in the next winter in summer it's like you know 50 degrees with humidity that's like 50 percent it hasn't gotten that part yet um but it is a a downward spiral and it's been observed by several independent scientists who are not playing by the IPCC rulebook, which is the IPCC wants to keep pushing the climate change, but it's their their rules are clearly not going for the game here. Um, in fact, I'm afraid to say it, if they keep making themselves look like a bunch of jerks, that uh, they're going to uh, be in deep trouble. Now, you said that even CERN was concerned isn't that funny the word CERN, C-E-R-N, happens to be part of the word concern, C-O-N-C-E-R-N, -E because certainly CERN is concerned, as they see, that again, like many independent um, climatologists are saying, is, is that this is definitely a beginning of a climate change for the colder seasons, and, um, you know, that worries me too, because the last major ice age, the human race almost went extinct, because we did not have the resources that we have today to keep warm. And because of that, because we now have all this technology, um, 
But we ha use something called just in time or JIT um, to make sure we get supplies at the time it's needed. With the roads becoming passable, people may find themselves wishing to God that they had a surplus of supplies, fuel and food. Okay. And um, the other problem is, too, is that, as you mentioned earlier about the, 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 the municipalities and the fact is that they're running out of salt. Salt, we know, is one of the most pro, uh, most powerful ways to melt ice and snow that is environmentally, at least in part, is for, um, responsible. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the best choice, but it certainly has um, been a successful means to um, handle snow and ice buildup. We've been using salt for for thousands of years for a variety of purposes. So salt is, you know... The problem is, is that the mines or the salt are is not in Winstead or Torrington, or even in Connecticut. And so the salt mines that make rock salt, for example, for the roads, which really is the same salt as your table salt. It's just it's mined a little differently in some cases, where they take big chunks of it and they blast it out of the salt out of the salt mines, and then it's crushed at at the mine itself and then it is transported by a conveyor up to the surface where it is then um, packaged as a variety of uses including table salt in some cases but of course with table salt um, it needs to be pure salt uh, of high quality whereas with rock salt it can have a little bit of dirt in it and no one's going to give a damn. Um, Morton salt uses a different system um, of injecting water into the mines to which the salt is absorbed into the water and then it's pumped out and then, it's, then it goes through a drying process. Uh, that's a different process. Um, that's used more for table salt or anything where you want to sell much higher quality um, because it's easier to pump brine out of the ground than it is to haul uh, chunks of salt uh, crystal out of the ground. Um, but no matter which way you get it, the salt is... Um, running out of short supply of what's available to the different municipalities. So there's a supply and demand issue. The demand's there. Yeah. But the salt isn't uh, available right now because all the people need the salt. So because of that reason, the salt mines are working as fast as they can to mine as much salt as they can. Um, but it's still going to take a while to replenish the salt supply uh, for the roads and stuff like that. And so um, a lot of people are wondering, well, what's going to happen if we do get, once we get start hitting more colder weather uh, every year? And the problem is, is I'm concerned about that too, because we're so used to, as I said, in just in time or shipping for you, um, you know, you, you transport things. As you need it. Right, that's what the problem with just in time is there's no warehousing. There's no warehousing. And um, that's good and that's bad. In this case, it's bad because it means that there is not an extra surplus um, more than what they put into the salt silos at the Department of Transportation um, salt and sanding stations. And uh, if there's not enough salt and sand in the silos, and if the weather is in climate, it's going to take a while for them to get another delivery and uh, that's going to slow them down big time. Now, how else is salt usually transported to these stations? Is it usually transported by truck or by train? It could be either one, actually. I think in Connecticut, it's mostly by truck. Mm -hmm. um, in areas where there is a, uh, a, a, a good, strong, successful freight transportation, it will be shipped by rail and then possibly at the railhead, it will be transferred to truck. Um, distribution centers where they go ahead and send it among the very way the problem is is that if there's not enough salt um the prices of what we're talking about here is is going to go through the friggin roof and a lot of towns right now in a lot of cities and even in several states are actually seriously are having a, a real hard time keeping up with the, the demands now pax did a number on the um people in atlanta georgia which are Ill prepared for what they received, and same thing for um, other southern states, which also experienced part of the polar vortex uh, event where the temperatures plummeted, but which was more of in the center of the country. Yeah, 
the polar vortex um, is really, really is a you could say it was a finger from the the great North Pole um, circular flow. This is controlled by the Arctic Oscillation or, or the AO. And when you have a, a, a strong positive AO, it stays mostly to the north. Um, think of the AO kind of like um, kind of like a golf score. Um, if the AO is positive, um, that's in some ways that's good for us. You know, because it's almost like a it's almost like a uh, a security fence, if you will. It means that it's, it's it's corralling the cold. But when it's low, which means below par, that cold is going to go farther out in as it did in the polar vortexes, and it, it's going to affect um, the, the portion of the United States. And uh, so, unfortunately, that left a lot of people ill prepared. Um, for example, so many people who are also become very complacent as well because they think that, oh, well, you know, oh, warming says I'm not going to need to worry about wearing heavy jackets anymore. I'm not going to need to buy heavy parkas. And then, unfortunately, a lot of people were ill-prepared and so were their pets. Yes, there was a cat that lost her ears because of frostbite. And um, during the last polar vortex, she's fine. She's earless. But she's fine. They had surgically amputated her ears. Uh, that sucks. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah, it does. It really does. You know, the thing is, what really bothers me, though, alone, is, is that there's just so much complacency going on right now. I'm going to tell you right now that one of the things as a North American Snow Queen is I don't want to see people take this as a joke. My job is not just making snow and ice and maintaining the weather, winter weather, from Yola to Astara. My weather, my work also covers edge, um, advocacy and education as well. Um, unfortunately, I think I failed in, uh, in some of those objectives, and I think we should try to fix up the problems. But I think that one of the things is, is that I've been having a lot of own personal issues too lately. Well, okay, let's talk about that in a second. But right now, okay, what do you think is going to happen for the next few weeks? Oh, I think we're going to get some more snow, and I think we're going to have some more colder temperatures. We're going to see some moderation coming up in a few days. Temperatures are going to modulate for a little bit warmer, but don't count on it staying that way. Uh, I see that, you know, by the time a star comes around, this is when, as I said this year, I will be changing hats because I was asked to be... Uh, the, the spring steward is by mother asna so i'll be doing both seasons this year and um obviously i'm going to do what i can to uh, begin to turn the season around um but it's going to take a while to because it's such a big system remember we got two things that control the weather and incidentally humanity is not one of them okay the first one is the sun um our sun has not really been running quite as hot lately. Um, also, the amount of solar flares and solar storms, while some of them have been spectacular, they really haven't been uh, quite as big of a solar maximum as was expected. And what's doing that's causing is is that the temperatures are um, starting to drop globally. Uh, another thing that's changing things is. Um, is that the Earth right now is it is it's perigee? It's actually a little farther away because it's winter. But lately, it seems that also um, we've been seeing more uh, climate change, as I said, mostly by the sun, but also some pointing out that because possibly of uh, particulates in the air from things like volcanism and other things. Is causing less sunlight to reach the Earth. There also has been some people saying that chemtrails could be possibly the problem as well. Do you think the government could be using the weather as a tool? Um, because weather is a very big system loom, uh, it's not like you can actually, I found this out from my work, you can't just change the weather in one little spot and not expect it to have um, ramifications uh, on a large, larger scale. The weather is a uh, very large system, and it wants to maintain its balance. 
But um, what that means that right now we got our hot spots and our cold spots. And our, we can see our cold spots are starting to uh, normalize and, t- and taking over the hot spots. So consistently over the world, you're starting to see temperatures dropping. Um, the, that's what CERN and independent scientists have been saying is that it's not like the IPCC um, uh, gore puppets wanted you to hear. Um, they want you to think that everything is going to be great and that it's all mankind's fault and everything. I don't think that they understand that I'm not saying that what mankind hasn't done and saying a lot since the Industrial Revolution has not had some impact. It certainly has done a lot of damage to our environment or our, our biosphere. I mean, we have poisoned the rivers. We have poisoned our air. We are dumping toxic chemicals into the ground. We are uh, burning up a tremendous amount of fossil fuels uh, very quickly. And um, and that certainly is not helping with the amount of particulates that may be in some ways causing the um, the uh, the sunlight to have less impact on the earth. The sun's already right now is weaker, so it's going to impact the earth too. But this is remember you got to understand one thing about the way the weather works is it's it comes in cycles. Okay, you mentioned that once before. What do you mean by cycles? Well, in the most part, a typical glaciation is about ninety thousand years. Ninety thousand years average. Ninety thousand years average. Okay, and we have in between those ninety thousand year periods, we have what we call interglacials. And they're called inter, which because that means between. Okay, between glacials. This is when the Earth begins to warm up. So for us humans, um, we have already reached kind of close to the end of the 10,000 year interglacial. So it really makes sense that the glaciations are going to start soon. In fact, they're already starting. And um, the reason why people need to um, be aware of this is so they can prepare for what they see going on. What should a person do? Honestly, what should they do? Come on, tell me. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna tell you one thing about is that you gotta start getting your head out of your ass, uh, and you gotta start looking around you and be more observant and stop worrying about, you know, some popularity show or something like that. You gotta start looking at the environment you live in. A lot of human beings lately have been too, you know, it's kind of like the old uh, concept from the from the '60s. Um, what was it? Stoned out, drunk out, toned out. Okay, right now that kind of attitude is the kind of thing that'll get you killed. And it's the smart uh, person who is aware of what's going on and is keeping up with um, the real truth that are going to do fine. It's those who are ill prepared, that are not looking at the truth, or saying that they're all oh, the people who are full of excrement, are going to basically find themselves in a very bad position. Human beings are very, uh, when faced with reality, once they finally get over denial, human beings are pretty creative. As I found this weekend when you realize that uh, when Ed borrowed the heater, you need to get some heat in here. So you use some incandescent lights in the studio to bring the heat up here. Yeah, and open the door to the hallway because it was warmer in the hallway. We got the heat fixed now, thank God. Yeah, but you know, the thing is, is that um, the... Once glaciation starts, and what we're gonna someday soon see a year without a summer. Okay, what exactly does that mean? A year without a summer? Well, in 1812, we had a really good example of this. Um, it was it was snowing in June in New England. It was deep. It was cold. It was like summer never came because technically summer and the calendar did come, but the uh, the cold was so entrenched that it just didn't leave. And uh, that was a that was a very small uh, micro glaciation. It was not a mini ice age. It was a mini ice age uh, from pretty much for about uh, three to four hundred years, which affected Europe. The mini ice age prior to the mini ice age, they had glaciations or interglacial that made it warm enough to grow grapes for wine in England. English wine. Uh, turned out to be very delicious, by the way. Unfortunately, it didn't last very long. Finally, by the year 1600, I think it was like in 1600, the Thames froze. Yeah, 
That's right. He froze the Tom's first. I kind of remember that. Yeah, I kind of remember that too. So they were having festivals on the Toms, and you could actually walk on the Toms River in England, and you could, um, you know, there was actually having festivals night on the ice. Fascinating. That was, unfortunately for the people uh, in the Dark Ages, um, it was once finally the Toms started to thaw on a regular, in the wintertime, it wasn't freezing up anymore. It's when finally... The Renaissance began. Now, the glaciation in this case lasted for about 300 uh, for, uh, what was it, about, uh, uh, maybe about 300, 400 years? Yeah, about that, yeah. So that was a mini ice age. That was a mini. And the year without a summer was a micro. I'd like to know what a nano is. Oh, we'll find out sooner or later. Um, anyway, the point is, is that, however, the big ice age... The big eye is coming. And um, so people need to be ready for that. And people need to rethink their strategies in a lot of areas of their lives. From clothing to home, home heating system design to su keeping supplies on hand, you know, goods and services, have them ready. Um, power failures are very likely to become a big problem. In the last 20, in the last 40 years, a lot of our society has actually beyond that, um, in, you know, say in the last 60 years, okay, we, human society has really pushed uh, computers and electricity and utility services and things like that. Um, is any of these, is anybody... Who lives in apartment complexes is going to be okay if glaciation starts? Uh, no, because especially apartment dwellers are going to be facing um, a lot of hardships, especially if you have electric heat. And even if you have central hot water heat or even um, central gas heat, which could be or oil heat, uh, it's going to affect your energy reserves. And, and that could be. Um, a really big problem um anyway so the point is is that to answer your question Liam, is is that the people um in the um uh, environment that uh these people have got to have alternative feeding systems we should have at least several um independent systems now does glaciation mean that we're not going to have the option of using solar power um Solar power may be a problem because it needs sun. It needs sunlight. And uh, since there's obviously we have a little bit less sunlight as we go through the glaciation, because the cloud cover of the, the cloud systems that are developing, plus, of course, the, um, um, the fact that the sun is running a little dimmer, is going to lower the output of the solar collection plants but quite a bit. Mm-hmm. However, wind is doing very well. Wind would be is a very strong contender for the uh, for the winter months, but because it is a mechanical system, it requires upkeep, and uh, and that's going to mean that uh, we'll be depending more on unfortunately not just wind, but on fossil fuels. So, do you think that some ways that if we start using up all this fuel, heating oil, natural gas? Uh, and wood, coal, that in some ways we might be doing ourselves a favor. Uh, no, I don't think it's in the long term it's going to be doing anybody a favor because um, we will be end up creating more of a shortage of fuel. Plus, with coal and wood, you're going to be putting more particulates into the air. And at the same time, you're going to start, as we're running out of fuel, we're going to start um looking for more fuel may it be from stripping harvest you know stripping more trees to um uh, you know strip mining from our coal and more doing more fracking to get oil this is going to uh, unfortunately add to the damage to the environment the biosphere we're in that's not good either so that's so that's we have to come up with a better solution Okay, on the individual level, what should you do for the long term? 
<clears throat> I think we'll first we'll start with the short term. When I say the short term, I'm thinking I'll talk about maybe about five years. Okay. First of all, always have more than one source of energy. Don't just have one source. Say, for example, if you get electric heat, have gas heat too. If you have oil heat, have wood or have gas. Have both. Um, the idea is keep you know redundancy in hand. Second of all, you need to dress warmly. Uh, you need to have the proper winter attire uh, if you're outside in the cold. And also remember that it's important to keep dry, um, especially if you're walking around outside, because there's nothing more that can lead to hypothermia than cold, wet, clammy, soggy clothing. And going out in that and trudging in snow and ice and everything else, it's going to take away your body's natural um, warmth barrier. Sure, it's maybe about a centimeter away from your body, but that's pretty important layer. Okay, what about eating habits? Okay, eating habits in the winter time, you're going to need two more things, and that is definitely something that I have been stacking up on. Carbohydrates are important. Those are the main energies that our body uses to keep our furnace running. And if we don't eat enough carbohydrates, our body begins the process of slowing down. And when it slows down, we're not producing as much natural warmth. And so that we start to get colder, quickly chill off. Um, the other thing is, too, is that we need to build, build up muscle. Muscle is essential for the um, production of um, energy. Because muscles produce more energy than, um, than, than fatty bodies do. Okay, yes, fat makes great insulation, but unfortunately, if you if you were to ask me to order donuts, I'll take both of them, thank you. <laughs> of course you would. Um, the um, the um, the issue with fat is it will help keep the heat close to you, which is great. Um, unfortunately, um, if you don't have a very active um, highly energetic body and you're not keeping active it doesn't matter if you look like uh, a giant big piece of uh, of uh, fat from a ham okay it's not going to do you any good because fat does not consume as much and it doesn't produce as much warmth as muscle tone does so you want to stay you got to find a balance between fat and muscle fat's good for food reserves energy reserves but it's not going to keep you warm because it, but fat does not produce the energy the caloric output that uh good uh active muscles do muscles produce a lot more energy but they require a lot more energy that's where you got the fat that's where you have to find a balance between the two okay um another thing is is that you need to consider um having a, a, a supply of food and water and other essentials on hand at all times um uh, forget just just in time is 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 guaranteed um uh you know it's just a good way for suicide honestly with you because you if you if you're only buying just enough food you need for when things are good and all of a sudden uh the weather gets bad and you can't get to the store because you're snowed in this is not good this is it, it, it things could get to the point eventually loom we ran winter storm emo Yes, I remember Winter Nero. That was last year. That was a doozy. That was a doozy. And you went out there, Cumberland Farms, and you had to roll over the snowbank to get home because you couldn't get out. It was a four in the morning, I remember that. And you had to get home. And you realize when you walked out the door is, if I'm going to go get some coffee, i got to roll out. i got to literally roll over the snowbank, which is what I did because I couldn't even climb in it. Because I couldn't even move my feet. Once, because once my foot got into the snowbank, I could barely get my feet out of the snowbank to trudge forward. You were almost potential. You could have froze to death right there. I could have if I didn't manage to get out of the snow somehow. But I was able to get out. I was lucky. But that's when I realized that if I want to go get a coffee, I have to roll over the snowbank and hope to God that I don't get hit by the. Uh, Department of Transportation snow plow if it was coming that direction, which they weren't. They were going the other direction. Okay. So we you got over, but again, um, that's another thing is how you how you get around in snow is very different than the way you get around in the warm weather. 
Yes, it is. Um, in the warm weather, you know, you can wear, um, you know, nice, you know, nice stylish shoes, and you know, it doesn't, you know, have to worry about getting frostbite in your toes. So you might wear nice fancy boots that look cute, and you know, maybe you're gonna, you know, wear some regular sneakers or something like that, suede shoes, whatever. But now, once you get into that cold weather like that, you gotta your feet are important, and you need good traction, and you also need to make sure that um that you keep warm at all times what would you suggest a person should have in their winter arsenal un um you should have a good set of boots you should have a good set of gloves that'll keep you warm you might want to consider getting a couple pairs of thermal undergarments such as underwear or whatever uh and leggings uh specifically to help prevent heat loss you need a good head scarf um, and the next scarf to keep the heat within your body. Sweaters, always good to have a few sweaters around and a jacket that is not going to wick moisture up. Uh, so unfortunately, down isn't really necessarily the best, especially if it gets wet. Some of the synthetic materials are wonderful, but again, um, uh, some of them are not quite as warm as down. So down is get kind of an advantage. It does keep you warm, but unfortunately, when it gets wet, it's useless. Yeah. Okay. And also, you got to be sure whatever jacket you have is that you keep it in good repair whenever possible. And for those of you who obviously have cars, you're going to want to make sure to prepare your car as well. Make sure you have a good, you change your oil. Make sure you keep up with the maintenance. Make sure you check your tires. Make sure you check your transmission fluid. Uh, make sure your antifreeze is, is got plenty in there. And uh, and also, you know, make sure that you understand that when, you're, when your car is freezing cold, this is more well-known for people in the northern climate, say like in Minnesota, Wisconsin, you definitely would be best to try to keep your engine warm um, and preferably keep the uh, the fluids warm so it would, it's because there's nothing harder on the engine than when you're trying to turn it over when it's freezing it causes a lot of damage to the rings and the pistons and it really does a number on the on the on the on other parts of the car as well so you really ought to keep make sure you keep up with your maintenance and 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 don't uh, try to s skip things because that could be a, a real bad thing to do, especially if it's going to be freezing. Um, and also, for like I mentioned, like let me mention the cat that lost her ears to frostbite. Please, guys, I don't really want to just, I don't want to try to be a meanie here, but you really got to make sure to watch for your, take care of your pets. Please, I'm serious. Um, if you can avoid it, don't let the cats outside. Don't let the dog outside. You know, even an outdoor dog, if he really has to be outdoor, could you find a way to warm up his doghouse somehow so that they don't freeze to death? I mean, this is really serious. I mean, remember, 10,000 I mean, ten thousand years ago, we almost went extinct because we ourselves were having a hard time coping. You certainly can imagine how much this affects their animals as well. Okay. What should a person do if they lose energy? Um, in a crisis situation, if you if you run out of fuel or you lose power or whatever and you have no heat, uh, temporarily you should bundle up at the very least. I mean, you should dress like you're going to be outside even though you're in the house just because it's going to get cold unless your house is really well insulated. Um, it's going to get cold in there eventually. Um, if you live in an old building like this, where they're like, there's no insulation in the walls whatsoever, you really, really seriously got to consider uh, the fact that it's the temperature is going to drop very quickly. And if there is, if it's an old building and it's drafty like this one, and you got a whole hard wind and it's blowing, it's going to come through all the drafty cracks, and then you're going to really know it. So again, you need to dress warmly. Second of all, like I said, you should consider having a backup heating system. And this is one of the reasons why landlords really need to um, consider that in, in, the, in the building renovations is having um, alternative heating systems for tenants. Maybe a space heater, 
uh, maybe hooked it to a natural gas or propane supply, whatever. Um, because if you run out of electricity or heating oil and your boiler isn't able to start, um, you know, it, it, it could make a big difference on your, 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 your people's lives that you're entrusted to. And so that's well, you need to consider that. And I'll tell you some things that you should never do, and that's because uh, people who have done this have found out really quickly um, just how quickly it can kill you. Is If you lose power, do not bring a charcoal grill into your house, please. And also, do not run a generator in a basement. Um, it is important to make sure always to read follow and understand all of your instruction book like norm abram used to say from this from new yankee workshop you need to know how to properly operate all of your equipment this because this is your responsibility there's nobody out there who's going to save your ass if you basically carbon monoxide yourself to death okay you need to consider safety first make sure for example if you are using portable heaters or space heater whatever or fireplace keep combustible objects away from the heat source okay no drapes around your electric heater please no drapes around your gas space heater no make sure to keep combustibles away from your wood stove or your fireplace i mean i don't think you want to burn your house to the ground and you certainly don't want to um potentially endanger your lives or your loved ones so you need to make sure that you're prepared for that well i want to thank you very much michelle for taking the time to talk to us about that and um and also i wanted to know is is there any way people should i mean if they need to go to a shelter should they go yes if there is a shelter in your area that has a generator has lights has heat go do not stay and try to be a hero. You'll, you might as well get it, go where it's warm because your life could very well depend on that. Okay? So dress properly and have you get your, your essential positions, your medications, whatever, and go to a, a shelter immediately. If you can safely get there. Now that's the if because if things are really bad, you may not be able to get to the shelter. In that case, if you think things could really get dicey, you should immediately call your local routine phone number of your local police department and let them know you're there. So, especially if you are in a wheelchair or if you whatever, so that they can arrange to get you to a shelter if they can. Do not call 911 unnecessarily. Please, I'm telling you, 911. Could well, I guess in this case, that one, one could count if you see someone's already served from hypothermia and you can see that they're freezing and that they are clearly are non-responsive, uh, then you definitely got an emergency that is life-threatening. That's where 911 is good for. But if it's for something like letting the police know your situation, please use the routine number of your local police department. Here in Winstead, um, that's in the yellow, it's in the white pages and the blue pages of our phone book. Uh, for those of you in Winston, it is area code 860 379 That's for routine police calls. It's if you need to use that, you need to use it, okay? Um, don't use 911 just to let them know you're okay, <laughs> okay? I don't think they'd appreciate that at all because that's probably be important for, obviously, for, am for accidents and things where they need immediate attention. The dispatchers are already overwhelmed as it is, so don't make their lives harder. Um, by calling an emergency number for a non-emergency call. And um, that's definitely what I would do right now. If I, if I really think, if I felt that the situation was really deteriorating really quickly, that's exactly what I would do. Okay, thank you. And, of course, um, if you want to contact me or Michelle, um, our numbers are easy to reach us at. We have a phone number, by the way. Yes, we do. Four eight six zero four six nine two eight two one. Just leave a message and we'll get to you. Okay, it's area code eight six zero four six nine two eight two one. That's Google Voice. Uh, we're also on uh, obviously 
email address is b-i-c-h-e-l-a-3 at gmail.com for me and for Lomi it is l-u-m-i f-i-n-i-s-t-r-a at gmail.com and of course we also are on google plus as michelle marie delani and Lomi finistro yes we have our own we have our own google plus accounts so if you want, add us to your friends list of both accounts, and we'll always be there for you. And also, don't forget, you can always leave comments in our videos here. Uh, for example, this is Lumi's video, so it just will be on her channel. I'll put a, a copy of it on my playlist, too, so you can see it. But make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let others know. Thank you very much. So for the rest of you guys right now, tonight will be about three to six inches of snow expected here in the Northwest Hills of Connecticut. And uh, I don't know if this is going to be how much more snow, if, if, if we're going to get beyond three to six inches or about uh, oh, 14 centimeters or whatever. But, you know, you, you just dress warmly, please, and stay, and, and stay safe, always. So we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.